I will invite you to find your seats while the choir calls us into worship. Let's pray. Lord of the seasons, thank you for the return of the light as we march toward spring and summer and life. Lord of our hearts, thank you for calling us together this morning, for opening your heart to us, 
and calling us into your presence. We pray that you will fill us with courage so that in this week we may act boldly for goodness. We pray that you will give us consolation in our losses. Give us wisdom that we may serve each other well. Lord, in this worship service, shape us, mold us, so that we may act as agents of your kingdom in the week to come. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering this morning is particularly for the church budget and it supports the ministries we do here at Green Lake. Proverbs calls us to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Today, let us give generously with our money and remember through the week to give gener generously with our voice. Will the deacon stand? Dear God, bless our offerings to do your work. Bless our words to speak for change and for truth. Bless our hearts with your compassion. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. Did you know that each one of you has a guardian angel watching over you? And they don't even just watch over you during the day. He or she watches over you all night long, too. And today, I'm going to tell you a story about when my guardian angel watched over me. See, when I was just a boy, about your age, my grandmother, my grandparents had a little cabin near the beach. And we'd go there in the summertime, my brother and I. And outside, we'd do fun things like make sandcastles and play on the rocks, go in the tidal pools and catch little crabs. But inside the house, we had a different game we played. See, upstairs on the second floor, there were some really smooth wooden floors, kind of like the ones here on the altar. And if you put a nice pair of socks on and got a running head start, you could really slip and slide a long ways. And I know my girls even like to do that today at our house, too. But who likes to slip and slide on wood floors? Yeah, I figured I'd get a few hands. Well, one day we were upstairs slipping and sliding, my brother and I. And you had to be a little bit careful. You couldn't go too far because at the end of the hall was the wall. And on the wall were some windows. And you didn't want to go anywhere near those windows. But that wasn't too bad because there was a handrail like this where we could stop ourselves. And I can remember my grandmother calling up from downstairs. She'd say, now you boys be careful up there. No horsing around or else you're not going to get any dessert. And she was probably making some good Maine blueberry pie because that's where this was back in Maine. So, But, and we always listened to our grandmother except for maybe this one time because we were horsing around. And my brother had just set the all-time slipping and sliding distance record. And since he was my younger brother, I certainly wasn't going to let that go. So I went back to the far corner of the house because I was going to see it as fast as I could run when I hit that, hit, this, hit the wood floors. And I gathered all my nerves, my wits about me, and I was going to run really fast. And I started running, and I was running so fast. I set new in-house speed records of 15 miles an hour that has since not been replicated. Let's just say I was going pretty fast. And when I hit that wood floor, I slipped and I slid so fast and so far. I went past my brother's mark, and I slipped and I slid so fast and so far. I even went past the little handrail that's supposed to slow me down. And do you remember what I said was at the end? A wall with windows, yeah. I'd like to tell you that I hit the wall and that would be the end of my story, but that's not the case. See, I was going so fast and I was headed right for those windows. And I crashed through the windows. Now, I didn't go all the way through and tumble to the ground, but I went through far enough with my head and my shoulders to see the outside world and to know that I was probably in trouble, and I could hear my grandmother coming up the stairs from horsing around. Now, do you, let me ask you a question. Do your parents let you pick up broken glass? No, why not? It's sharp, and what happens when it's sharp? You cut yourself. And the kind of glass that shows up on windows when you break them is extra sharp, and they have big pieces. And I think that most people who crash through windows probably have to go to the hospital afterwards for big cuts. So hopefully no one has ever done that before. But I am happy to report I did not even have a scratch on me because of my guardian angel. And uh, I, she was up, I call her a she, it can be a he or she, depending, but my mind's a she, was watching over me. And I have many stories like that. I employ my guardian angel full time, sometimes overtime. And do you know guardian angels will protect you all the time? It's even things you don't even know about. <clears throat> There's a verse in the Bible. It's in Psalms 91, verse 11. And it says, the Lord gives his angels charge over you to protect you in all your ways. So just remember that anytime. Your guardian angel will protect you from harm. All right, so we can collect some money in the blue buckets. Money goes to the Holbrook Indian School in Arizona. 
Don't forget the choir up there and the uh, second floor in the back. Thank you for listening to my story. Dear God, we ask forgiveness and we ask for healing of the soul. We pray also for healing of the body, for Diane, for Julie, and for Bernice. We pray for continued safety as we travel, as we are here. We ask a, a special blessing on the Chetelwadas. We pray for safety and healing in the world. For those in turmoil in Syria and, so and Central Africa, we pray for the displaced, for those looking for safety and a new home. We ask for compassion to help those who cannot help themselves. We ask for a humble heart to learn from those we think are beneath us. We ask for courage 
to stand up for what is right. We thank you for the safety you provide us and the promise that we are in your strong arms. Let us live in that safety and not in fear. You have blessed us beyond our imagining, and we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is Genesis 1, 20 through 28. Then God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground.
The New Testament reading today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Jesus went out to the lake with his disciples, and a large crowd followed him. They came from all over Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, from east of the Jordan River, and even from as far north as Tyre and Sidon. The news about his miracles had spread far and wide, and vast numbers of people came to see him. Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready so the crowd would not crush him. He had healed many people that day, so all the sick people eagerly pushed forward to touch him. And whenever those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, the spirits would throw them to the ground in front of him, shrieking, You are the Son of God. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Thursday night, I went to a memorial service over in Greenwood. It was in a large upper room. And I walked into the the space, a very welcoming space. Up front, there was a table with two or three rich arrangements of flowers. There was a book for writing memories. And then as I, I watched the crowd assemble, I was, I, was, I was impressed with this crowd. To me, they looked young. <laughs> you know, and those of you who are grandparents will understand, you know, people, you know, that, that keeps shifting. But these were young people. They were beautiful people. They looked to me to be successful people. Some of them had kids in tow. We were there for a memorial service for somebody named Elijah. And the spelling is not what we're used to, but it's it's an Eastern European spelling of the, the Bible name Elijah. We were there for his memorial service. Sitting there, I was struck by the difference between what I was experiencing and what I had expected. I I knew Elijah's name and face. Not much more than that. I think I'd probably only had really just one conversation with him. And maybe even a conversation would be stretching it. He had talked to me once and told me about some disaster in his life which could have been any day because his life was a disaster. And just sitting there, I was struck with a contrast between this room full of beautiful people and Elijah. I would see Elijah on Tuesdays when I was at Aurora Commons, usually sitting at the computer playing a game. He was scary looking. He had a a strange tattoo over his left eye. Some of his teeth were missing, which made his grin a little scary. When he walked, it was kind of awkward and ungainly. That's about as much as I knew. And I'm sitting there feeling the contrast. Where did all these beautiful people come who were here at a memorial service for Elijah? The memorial service began with a video, and I'm glad they did. A few months ago, somebody shot this video of Elijah and had Elijah kind of tell a little bit of his story. It was short. It was, I think, seven minutes long. But by the time the video got done, I knew more about Elijah. And the contrast in some way, well, the contrast not in some way, was even stronger between this congregation of beautiful people and the person they had come to grieve and remember. 
Elijah lived with his father for the first seven years of his life. He said that his father had 25 personalities. He said, have you ever tried to talk to somebody with 25 personalities? And in my head, I'm imagining a little kid trying to interact with an adult. And you begin to think about the chaos of the world for this little kid when you don't know who's home today. He said he finally learned to expect nothing but abuse. He figured he had experienced every kind of abuse there was. I try not to think too far behind those words. Finally, at age seven, he escaped from dad's house and he went to live with mom. He lived with mom until he was 13. And at that time, the cost of feeding this teenager was high enough that it was impacting her ability to buy drugs, and so she kicked him out. And he'd been on the streets for the 25 years since then. That was Elijah's life. Unwanted, abused. Christmas Day, Elijah died. An overdose in somebody's van. Elijah was such a throwaway person, such an insignificant bit of humanity that he was in the van for several days because the person who owned the van was trying to figure out, what do I do with this body that's in my van? Because I don't want to be involved with the police. But I got to do something. Finally, the owner of the van did what a lot of unfortunate people on Aurora Avenue do. They thought to get a hold of Lisa. Or maybe it was Karen. It was one of the gals there at Aurora Commons. And that person then acted as the intermediary and got the police there. And, and the body was taken care of properly from a public health point of view. But one of the deepest, one of the deepest characteristics of being human is marking death. Death is not trivial, it's huge, and we mark it. In the Bible, you go back to the Cain kills his brother Abel, and God marks it. And he says, God says to Cain, Cain, your brother's blood is crying from the ground. Death is, even the earth, Cain, is, re, is reacting to this act of violence and this death. To be human, we, we somehow sense the enormity of death. You step away from scripture, you look at anthropology, the earliest homo sapien sites, you go back 100,000 years, the earliest evidence that there is a homo sapien on the planet, there's evidence of ritual connected with death. And here's Elijah, who has died after a life of being unwanted and trashed. And he's dead, but who cares? But the story does not stop there. This is not, in that sense, a tragedy. We all die. And for Elijah, in some ways, death was a rest. But that's not enough to make this story. Elijah's mother was gone. She's died. Elijah in the video said he did not know where his father was, and that was a good thing, because if he did, he'd have to go find him and kill him. And you don't know if he would do it, but you know he wasn't joking when he said it. Elijah had two brothers somewhere in the universe, but not here. So who will treat 
Elijah, the dead man, as a human. Aurora Commons. Elijah came to Aurora Commons every Tuesday. That's all that I knew. But in the rest of the memorial service, we heard stories. And these beautiful people, these people with kids in tow, these people who had houses with showers in them would tell stories of inviting Elijah home and letting him take a shower. As one of them said, a 45-minute shower. As they talked together about Elijah, they talked about their friendship with Elijah. They could not fix Elijah. He had experienced major brain trauma as a, a young man. He had seizures that he believed were, were the direct consequence of it. He was messed up in his brain and in his soul and in his body. But these people, because of their connection with the Awake Church and the Aurora Commons, they had befriended this man. And when he died, they put on a proper funeral. These beautiful people claimed this broken man as theirs. He was part of their circle, their family. And to me, that is a, be a, a, a beautiful picture of what Christianity is about. What does it mean to be spiritual? If we're Christians, it has something to do with modeling our life Aligning our lives with the teachings and example of Jesus. These people did what Jesus did. I love the gospel reading this morning. There, you, you find this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's two or three times where they will just kind of do a summary. You can't give all the details. Jesus is out preaching, doing whatever. In this case, it begins with Jesus withdrew. Jesus tried to disappear, but Jesus can't disappear. So he goes over by the sea to get away, and it says great crowds follow him, mobs follow him from Jerusalem and Judea and Tyre and Sidon and Idumea and Transjordan, everywhere. They were drawn to Jesus. And I like to think that when Jesus stood there and he looked out at these crowds, he saw all of them as his people. The gospel story highlights that. As, is it Dalton? <laughs> Mr. Durr <laughs> saying beautifully for us. You know, Jesus highlighted that, that the people that we might instinctively think they're outside, Jesus pulled them inside. The story of the lepers, by law excluded, Jesus pulls in. The woman caught in adultery, by law to be stoned, Jesus pulls in. Pharisees, people we love to hate on, Jesus went to dinner at their house. Jesus looked to the farthest edges of the crowd, whether speaking the farthest edges literally or simply metaphorically, they were, they were his. And so for us who model our life after his, we look to the farthest reaches and we see that is still us. It's not them, it's us. A few years ago, 10, 15 years ago, I developed a problem when I was hiking. If I wore my hiking boots and I went for more than about five miles, somewhere between five and seven miles, that was a limit, two of my toes became problematic. I don't know where this came from. You know, all my life they had behaved themselves, but now I would get blisters on the two my two fourth toes on each foot, the fourth toe out, would get a blister. So I learned what to do. If I was going to hike more than five miles, I would tape my toe before I went. 
And I can remember we're getting ready, and of course I'm always late, and everybody else is ready to go, and then I know, oh, for, I forgot the tape. Wait a minute, I gotta tape my toe up. Pull off my boot, pull off my sock, put the tape on. It's annoying. But it never occurred to me not to take care of the toe. Because as insignificant as the fourth toe is, it's me. And these toes continue to be problematic. Now they don't get blisters. When I started running long distances a year or two ago, if I ran on the road with my favorite shoes, those toes had a problem in the joints. So when I run on the road, I can't wear my favorite shoes. Well, I could, but because these toes are me, for their sake, I wear different shoes. In the New Testament and across Christian history, there's a well-developed notion of the church as the body of Christ. There is a minority tradition that understands that the church as the body of Christ is really a picture of Christ's engagement with the whole of humanity. And so... When Jesus sees a fourth toe that, is, that requires extra care, Jesus says, that is my toe. That is me. It's a challenging picture. If we embrace this concept... I think it can give us some wisdom about our place in the world. Two things that I would say. A traditional thing is we want to be embracing and accepting and caring. But the other thing that it clearly teaches us is the importance of elitism. My toe cannot take care of itself. As a church, we do not merely teach that everybody needs care, everybody deserves care. We teach that we are called to care, which means we are called to develop to the highest possible capacity everything we've got. I'm reading a book right now written by a neurosurgeon. You know, they don't finish school until they're in their late 30s. And I'm not really interested in having an egalitarian perspective on brain surgery. Right? You know, the other day I was in in the coffee shop um, uh, near my house. And I was listening to a group of, so there's a group of old people. Like, they're there every day. And I see them sometimes when I'm there. And one of them is a pilot. Somebody else came in that I've seen before, and he greeted, but he was about my age or younger, and he greeted them, and then he left, and then they started talking about him, and it was funny listening to them talk. So the old guy, who's a retired pilot, had been a captain, on a, a plane captain, or whatever, I'm not sure the terminology. They were talking about this guy who was working on getting his captain's license, permit, whatever it was. He, he was wanting to, to, to move up a step as an airline pilot. The old captain was completely dismissive. He said, he doesn't want it bad enough. He's just, he's just doing it right now because he's about ready to retire and he wants to jump up a notch. And I was listening to it and I'm going, you know, who do you want flying your plane? Somebody who wants to be the best pilot in the world or somebody who said, well, hmm, I guess I better study hard. Because he had been joking. The younger guy had been joking about, well, I got to go study. Yeah, yeah I got to study. You know how that is. And I don't want somebody studying just so they can get, not if you fly on my plane. 
Christianity teaches the value of cultivating every potential that we've got. And if we're going to care, being good at it. Christianity is not egalitarian in the fundamental sense. And then it tells us that once we have become masters, we are to take that mastery and we are to care for the fourth toe. Martin Luther King, for those of us who are white, it may be easy to think, well, of course, he was a black guy, so he had to do that. No, he could have lived a comfortable life. He did not ride buses. He didn't have to lead a, to help organize that bus boycott. He didn't have to do, he could have lived a comfortable life with a good income. He had a good education. He was set. But he understood that every advantage and privilege that he had was an obligation to serve. And he set an example that will challenge all of us to the core of our being if we heed it. He lived as a Christian. And so we are called to do the same. As I was sitting there in the memorial service and thinking about Elijah, who if it was not for Aurora Commons, would have had no one to mourn him. Certainly no one with the, with the resources to be able to have a service. I'm thinking about a mother who would, who would kick her son out because feeding him competed with buying her drugs. But I was also remembering conversations that I've had with other mothers. The mothers who are the picture of what it means to be mothers. I remember several recent conversations I've had with, with mothers whose children were dealing with gender issues. And heard the ache and pain in their voice as they described to me the ache and pain in their child's life as they wrestle with this impossible thing. I thought of recently listening to an Adventist minister and his wife talk about where could they find a place in the Adventist church for their gay son. And I'm asking, why do we have to ask that question? Even the fourth toe gets my attention, and not just my attention, but my affection and my care. Surely our children, all of them, deserve nothing less. It's a high calling. To stand with Jesus and look to the farthest edge of the crowd and see my people. One last picture from the memorial service. People shared memories. Preachers shared memories. Non-preachers shared memories. The first person to speak, she said, when I first met Elijah, I was, I was just coming out of prostitution. Elijah and I became friends. And she talked about, they had a lot of fun together. They went to movies together, because she had some money, he didn't. <laughs> they, they laughed together, they drank together. They did life together. And then there was this picture. She said, I remember one time I was sitting on the couch and Elijah had his head in my lap. 
and I was stroking his head. And he said to me, no one has ever done that before. I don't know what skill you have. I'm not aware of anybody here coming out of prostitution. Maybe you've just come out of grad school. Maybe at the top of your career. But every one of us are claimed by Jesus. And then he invites us to take what we have. Touch one another with healing love. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.